Good morning, everyone who's attending. We're going to wait just a couple more minutes to allow attendees to, to sign in and then we'll get started. You know, it looks like our numbers kind of holding steady there. So I think panels, you are ready to get going. Should we do it? All right, good. Well, welcome everybody this morning to uh, our session um, about attainable housing from policy to action. Uh, we've got a great uh, group of panelists here to talk about their experience uh, with, uh, with the affordable housing, the barriers that they're facing, the issues, resolute or solutions that they're finding. I think we'll have a really informed discussion uh, about this topic today. Uh, a few housekeeping things. Just um, if you have questions, please raise your hand. Uh, we'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So probably halfway through or so uh, in our presentation, um, we're going to allow the panelists to have some time to talk and then kind of have a discussion among themselves and then open it up to all of you. So uh, please keep your questions on hand and we'll, we'll take those at the end. Um, and we will be done at uh, 1240 and we have to end right on time. So we'll make sure that we try to get to as many questions as we can before we have to wrap up. Um, just a quick introduction to our session uh, and then I'll introduce the panelists and turn the time over to them. Um, as many of you know, and you're here because of our uh, affordable housing crisis in Utah and it's been going on for some time and cities are finding ways to provide more housing that is attainable to the people who wanna to move to or live within their cities. Um, it's becoming more and more challenging. Recently, Jim Woods uh, gave us a statistic of 60,000 renter households who are extremely cost burdened. So spending more than 50% of their rent on their housing costs. Um, that's about 200,000 people. So that's a, a lot of households that are being affected by our current housing market. We also know that housing prices to purchase are all time highs, um, making it very hard for people to buy a uh, home and uh, in a neighborhood where they'd like to live. Um, and it's it's just, we're, they're not able to find the housing. So um, all around, people are having a hard time finding a place that is affordable to them where they can spend 30% or, or less of their income on their housing costs. So today we hope to get some good ideas and some feedback from our amazing panelists. I'll take a moment to introduce them and then we'll turn the time over to them. We have. Shirlane Quell, who is the di Director of uh, Economic Development and Housing in St. George, as she just told us, it's in the ninth, it's in the 80s there, so it sounds wonderful. Um, we're glad to have Shirlane here. We have Carson Ehlers from, um, Eilers, Ehlers, uh, from uh, the Utah League of Cities and Town. he's a, uh, Towns, he's a legislative analyst there. And we have Mayor Mark Shepard from Clearfield, and uh, the mayor is in his second term up there, and we're grateful to have him here talking to us about what his city is doing. We also have Meg Ryan, who is the uh, land manager, land use manager for Utah League of Cities and Towns. And Meg will be participating in our panel discussion later on. So uh, with that, Sherlane, I'm gonna turn the time over to you for a brief presentation. We have about five to 10 minutes for each panelist, and then we're gonna have a discussion among panelists and then open it all up to you. So with that, Sherlane, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here, and I'm excited to listen and learn from all my fellow panelists and the uh, sessions of the, the participants today. So I am also really excited to talk about attainable housing. Um, I don't have a formal presentation today, but I wanted to kind of share a story about how I got involved in, in this discussion and some of the things that we are doing and finding in southern Utah around solving and trying to solve attainable housing. So I started with the city of St. George not quite two years ago. And um, I am the director of economic development and housing. And I really, this starts with the city uh, looking at how to address those two issues together. 
we cannot look at housing and economic vitality in separate silos. They are very, very integrated. And so I had a lot to learn on the housing side. And it is, you know, it's a steep learning curve, but it's been so fun. One of the first things that we did is um, I started going to, you know, all these meetings. And on day two of my job, I went to the intergenerational poverty meeting for our county. And on day three, I went to the LHCC meeting, um, local homeless coordinating committee meeting, which I was a co-chair of and had absolutely no idea what that meant or, or even what it was um, and um, you know there were all of these these meetings happening this was in early 2019 and I was looking at it saying call oh, there are all these same conversations and a lot of overlapping um, challenges and solutions and providers and people on all of these you know coming to all these different meetings where does it all fit and then the economic development side of it was also taking place at the time too and those, all those conversations and so as we really started to dive into housing specifically, because I needed to understand that better in order for me to be more effective in my role, one of the things that our community found right away, it took us about two months of just going out and talking to every stakeholder we could find um, and pulling together all the people from all these different all these different meetings and you know me trying to understand what was going on with them and and pulling the um, the county community development director into it as well. Um, we realized that housing, yes, we know it's a challenge, but we didn't really understand what that looked like and what it needed to look like. We had a lot of good information and data on the extremely low income needs because of Switch Point Community Resource Center and because of the work that was going on for homelessness in our community. And we knew that there was a gap in kind of low and moderate income, but we didn't really understand what that looked like. And what we found, we found two things. We found that number one, we needed to get better data, data. And we understood when we found that we needed to change the way we were talking about affordable housing. The biggest lesson that we came away with um, in, in this listening tour, if you will, was that the word affordable has a major uh, stigma in our community. We kept, you know, I'd never heard of nimbyism before. Um, I was like, wow, that totally makes sense. And yes, it does happen here too. We're a very collaborative and loving community, but we still don't want, a lot of our, our residents and neighborhoods don't want affordable housing in their backyard. But what they do want is housing that their kids and grandkids and our college graduates and our school teachers and our you know public servants all of those folks our service professionals they do want housing that those folks can afford and so we started changing the messaging around that and started talking about attainable housing and it has completely redirected the efforts in our community to be able to talk about it in this positive way across the board and message it and share data in a way that we can we can help everybody in the community that cares about this understand it from their perspective so we can talk to cities about what that looks like we can talk to business owners about what that looks like for their employees we can talk to dixie state university about what that looks like and what their needs are for their faculty members and their staff that they're trying to recruit our school teachers you know our um, tourism professionals all of those pieces and really that one word of shifting to attainable made a huge difference in our community and so i'm excited excited to have this session include attainable housing. Um, one of the, the key things that came out of that effort was we formed a coalition, a coalition here just of a whole bunch of community stakeholders from municipal government, um, we have concerned citizens, we have developers, we have um, lenders, we have realtors, we have, you know, all the nonprofits that are engaged in housing in some way, and we have the Housing Action Coalition now in its basically just starting our second year um, we lovingly call it hack and our goal is to hack that housing challenge in southern utah and completely change it so that we are meeting all of the housing needs for all of our income levels all of our ages it's not just about one demographic it's about everyone and it's about our community coming together so we've you know I can get more into kind of what we learned. I don't think it's going to be a big, a big 
uh, surprise, you know, we have, we're very, very low on the extremely low income housing spectrum. We need more in that space for sure. Um, but now we understand what it looks like and what the needs are for our community. So we can, we've benchmarked it. Now we can monitor it. We watch, you know, how many rentals and how many um, homes are for sale and what price ranges, how that overlaps with our AMI for our, for our area. Um, so we can really continue to educate. Um, I'll leave it with this hacks approach and really what we try to do across the board for Southern Utah is really just collaborate. We all work together. Um, we're all committed to working together. This is about a, it's a committee coalition of about 30 different people that are actively engaged um, and from all those different groups. So we really do collaborate to try to understand what are the barriers and the challenges and get together on solutions. We really network to pull in those different ideas. Um, we educate our community. And then the last piece is that we really celebrate what the wins are. We celebrate what's already happening here. Because the other thing that we found was, yes, there's a challenge and there's a gap, but there are amazing things happening in our community and amazing people really trying to, to um, add a drop to that bucket. And we really wanted to put this in a positive light. And so we, we spent a lot of time celebrating all of those, those wins so that we can continue in that positive trajectory. Mike, are you frozen? I'm on mute. There oh, we go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> the video's not moving. <laughs> oh, is it not? I, I, there you I'm, go. I'm not now sure how good the Wi Fi here is. So, so um, thank you. Great presentation. Good information there. Um, Carson, let's turn the time over to you for your presentation. All righty. I have a quick slideshow I'll pull up here. Um, I'd like to just. Oh, where did that go? Okay. Um, if everybody can see that, all right. I'd like to just go over some of the high level, maybe statewide policy efforts that have been undertaken and kind of look at the, the challenges on a statewide level. Um, I'd first like to address what attainable housing is. When we've had these policy discussions, one of the really distinct challenges is are we, are we addressing broad housing affordability, meaning the mean, kind of the median price, everybody's cost of housing, or do we need to focus on that really like what we would traditionally think of as affordable housing, housing at targeted income levels? And one of the challenges is sometimes those two policy levers are, uh, are different, right? Sometimes by choosing a policy for housing affordability, you are limiting uh, what could be naturally occurring affordable housing or um, sometimes when you choose to create uh, deed restricted or true affordable housing units, you might also be restricting the total number of units that could be produced and that has an impact on overall housing affordability. So it's important to, when we're talking about housing affordability, I think to, to kind of look at what the specific populations that we're trying to address are. And then I'd like to go over a little bit of the history of, of housing costs in Utah because I think it's also important to look at all the different factors. We know that housing markets are notoriously complex and there's no one easy solution, unfortunately. So that's why it's important that we have such a, a team effort in Utah. Um, just to go over a couple quick factors, we've had record population growth in the state of Utah. Everybody along the Wasatch Front is very familiar with this. Uh, both, and that's both internal population. We have young, relatively young population in other states. We have large families, but that's also net immigration from states like California and Washington. So we have those kind of dual challenges. Um, we have uh, the 2007 market collapse really disrupted our housing market in a big way and in, in a disruptive multiple factors at that level where we had uh, record housing production in the 2005, 2006, then we just saw that fall off. And this is really where we, you might hear the term housing gap and this is really where this started to emerge because you had a combination of um, of customers who didn't feel comfortable buying homes, you had the you had home builders who weren't producing homes, and so you had this whole mix of problems. And we're only now starting to really recover from that. And this is a combination of market forces. This is uh, financial resources. This is economic comfort levels. So again, a really polyfactorial problem. But we really saw that problem emerge in 2007, and only this year did we really start to um, produce enough units to. Uh, Get, uh, so start to break those records again and start to really ramp up production. 
but there are challenges to that and impediments. And um, we have rising land costs, rising material costs. We have, and some of these are out of our control, right? Some of these are market factors. Uh, we have national tariffs on on lumber, for example. A two by four will now cost you six dollars in many parts of the state. Um, we have uh, increasing attention from out-of-state investors, and that's causing a whole other set of problems. But we have all these challenges as we try to build affordable housing and try to build housing at a generally lower cost. There's a lot of impediments. Now, cities do hold a, we like to call it a key to housing, a, a key to the problem, right? So local governments generally don't build housing unless you're maybe Park City or uh, Salt Lake City's RDA. So local governments generally um, control the the key regulation and lend use authority. Um, but it's not as simple as just we need more density. That's maybe one piece of it, but it also is important to consider where, ho where housing is being built. If you build housing near transportation, it can substantially reduce household costs because you know if, if a family has to drive an hour to get anywhere, they might have an affordable house, but their transportation costs rise enough to almost offset that. Um, and it's also important to have access to amenities, schools, Healthcare facilities, so that uh, so that you have uh, you have access for families who would be needing the affordable housing. Um, and then again, to echo the, the the density doesn't necessarily equate to affordability. Um, it's one one piece of the puzzle, but um, there's plenty of high density units that are going up that are not um, anywhere near attainable for a lot of families. And but again, um, some of those age into affordable housing over time, and so it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not just that one one uh, silver bullet. I think the, the best approach that we've heard from cities is trying to focus on a variety of housing options, right? That's uh, the missing middle housing, that's ADUs, that's um, affordable housing, that's luxury housing. And it's important to have a variety of, uh, of housing options for communities. So you have communities with different incomes, you have, um, you don't have stratified communities where what the affluent population lives on one side and the uh, less affluent live on their side. So it's important you really have those, those uh, mixed asset communities. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Senate Bill 34, which was kind of a landmark bill two years ago, and it's been, a, it's been an ongoing process. But what this bill really did was combine housing policy and transportation policy. So the state investment, the transportation investment fund is now tied to the fastest growing and largest cities housing plans. And these are moderate income housing plans. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. A number of cities had comprehensive moderate income housing plans before SB 34, but the idea behind SB 34 was every, of these 82 cities, everybody had to have some commonalities or some common themes so that you have consistency along the Wasatch Front and off the Wasatch Front too. Um, and, and these are three to four strategies, and I'll go over some of those top strategies in a moment here. There's a menu of 24 strategies that the state has identified of um, ranging from rezoning to uh, de-restricting units, and there's a whole bunch of tools at their disposal. But since housing policy, housing needs look different in every community, you really need different solutions, and this bill provides both consistency and the flexibility for cities to implement those across the board. Um, housing challenges obviously look different in Farmington and Vernal, and and there's no one size fits all, so you need to have that degree of flexibility. Now, those most common strategies are rezoning for higher densities to produce affordable housing, creating for and reducing regulations for ADUs, which are accessory dwelling units, um, maybe more commonly called granny flats or second apartments, or uh, and then uh, allowing higher density and mixed use zones so that um, you can have higher impacts without the same uh, challenges that might be posed in a residential neighborhood. And then also encouraging higher density along transit investment corridors. Not every city has a transit investment corridor, but this was a pretty popular strategy among those who did. And then finally, I'd like to just touch on some of the challenges that we've seen in implementing SB 34 and more broadly with COVID-19. I'm sure everybody on here is tired of hearing the word COVID-19, but um, it, it is an ongoing challenge. We had communities who were initially disrupted by the public planning process, both in city councils and planning commissions, and cities were quick to adapt. Most cities did not really halt any land use processes, but there was, a, there was some early challenges to be addressed. Um, COVID-19 has also really uh, drummed up interest in, in new housing, whether that's 
uh, young people looking to move out of apartments into single family homes, whether it's um, folks who are looking to downsize housing to make it more affordable because they lost employment. Um, any number of reasons we have seen a huge demand in housing. The first half of 2020, according to the Governor Policy Institute, broke the record for uh, both single family and multifamily units drawn. So we've seen a, a huge uptick there. And one other piece that is less talked about, but I also want to mention is uh, the increase in, in investment that we're seeing. And this is kind of a double-edged sword because more investment could finance more units, but it also could drive overall costs. And, and I think it's an important piece that's not talked about. So I just want to quickly quote the, the CBRE family report. Despite the challenges faced with daily operations, aggressive lending rates have investors very enthusiastic about competing for opportunities to purchase assets along the Wasatch Front. Investor capital is hungry for Salt Lake deals and the low interest rate environment is putting downward pressure on cap rates, creating pre-COVID-19 pricing as investors aggressively compete to buy product. Coupled with the lack of available properties to buy in the market, sellers are realizing some of the highest prices ever paid. And now I don't necessarily um, I'll leave it kind of open-ended to what exactly will happen because of this, but I think it's an important influence. And, and even as we're building more units, it doesn't necessarily mean they're affordable. We know that across the state, rental units are typically more price burdened than rental uh, households are more price burdened than owners. And so we have some of these complicated challenges that are posed by COVID-19. Again, cities have just one tool of many to try to address them, but um, it's, it's a polyfactorial and not an easy process to solve. And um, with that, I'll turn over the time to Mike and Mary Shepard. Well, thanks. Uh, you, you bring up some, you know, Carson bring up some really good points. And probably the biggest challenge we have on a, on a municipal level is what is the role of, of government in affordable or attainable housing? Um, you, you're trying to create a city that is is beautiful, uh, is a place where the current residents want to live. You, that's what you're trying to, to accomplish, and yet at the same time, you want to make sure that you've got stuff that is uh, affordable and attainable for everybody at every level. And that's not always possible. Clearfield's a city of, of roughly 32,000 people, and for oh, just about ever, we've been the hub of the majority of Davis County's attainable or affordable housing. Uh, we've been that spot that people go. And then the market changed. And a house that was $125,000 to $150,000 10 years ago is now three hundred dollars um, And our entry-level homes in Clearfield are now in that $300,000 range. It is hard to find even our, our single-level homes. Uh, very difficult to find something yeah, under a 275, which, and if it's on the market for, you know, two hours, it's a, at that price, it's a miracle that it, it's just gone. The last several years to us have, have been brutal. And so as we've had a chance to look at, you know, what do we do to, to address the, uh, the, the attainable housing situation and make sure that, that our children, I mean, our residents' kids can stay in our own city. And that's hard in every city. Uh, it, it's really hard when your kids grow up in Clearfield and you say, hey, I want to stay in Clearfield, Dad, and uh, my daughter lives across the street from me, and then I've got two kids that can't afford houses at this point. Uh, they would love to, to do that, and they, they can't afford housing, period. They're struggling to find apartments that will fit within their range. So a couple of years ago, um, about two and a half years ago, we, we implemented uh, our form-based code which focuses much more on aesthetics than it does on use, uh, with the in intention of that to really drive that density in our downtown corridor. Uh, apartments have been a swear word in Clearfield for ages and ages, so you just didn't use the A word. It, it's, it, it's where we are. It, it's how society is, and it's a different people, in many cases, living in apartments at this point. As we went to clean up our corridor and change the vision of a city, at the same time focusing on attainable housing, we crossed the line kind of both ways um, and, and in a very dangerous way. Uh, we, we, Clearfield had a mobile home park of about 205 units that was known by its address by every law enforcement agency in Davis County. 
um, and Weber. Uh, 402 South State Street, Clearfield Mobile Home Park was on everybody's map. Uh, not the place you wanted to be. It was the epitome of what a slumlord is. Uh, in fact, at its closing two and a half years ago, there were 55 roughly habitable units. And habitable would be a very strong stretch of that word. Uh, leaking roofs, uh, just unsafe homes. And so when, it, uh, when the owner died, we made a decision as a city to purchase the property. Uh, we, in fact, we overpaid for it because the demand for that property and the bids on it were so high that uh, they were out, everyone would have loved to have just taken it over. But as you try to change a city and try to make things better, we, like I say, we, we did that one thing that some would have looked at and said, how dare you? You took the one affordable, really affordable, piece of housing, albeit unlivable, one of the most affordable places in the county to live. Uh, dangerous for us to do on a, on a policy basis, on a, just on a, on a personal basis for us and people. We allotted enough money when we bonded to take this over. I insisted that we have enough money put into that bond to relocate every one of these people and pay first and last month's rent. We worked with every single renter in that in that facility to try to find them a place to go we now have they're just about to break ground on the first apartment building in that unit and the first set of townhomes that will be built together with that first apartment building we have uh, insisted that the and worked with the developer to ensure that the this first phase of this project is all funded through litec and i got to tell you that's wonderful because this is housing that is now will be affordable, not just, I mean, it, it's attainable. I can't say it's, it's always affordable, but it, in, in the case of most of our residents, it's affordable. It, it is a place that they could live. We're talking three bedroom, two bath townhomes with a two car garage. They've been required to build at the same level that we would build anywhere else in the city. And they are beautiful buildings that are, that are set to be built. We've had a real struggle. Uh, with COVID, we saw something happen that I don't think anybody expected. And that was that LIHTC funding disappeared. Uh, here we are in this mad rush trying to build attainable housing. And then you take away the best possible funding source to make that happen. And it's not that it was taken away. It's just that investors typically who invest in LIHTC uh, just aren't putting the money there anymore. They, they didn't need the tax write-offs with COVID. And so those big major corporations who have historically invested in high tech funding just didn't. And our project stalled for a bit where finally the developer has got their funding coming online. And so we'll break ground shortly on that project. It's had to be a partnership between us and, and a developer to make sure that we're getting built what we one, a product that is gorgeous and will not detract from a downtown that we're trying to create, and at the same time, be the hub for our, our best possible affordable housing within the city. This past week, we met as the city council to start discussing uh, accessory dwelling units and, and looking at ADUs. Carson talked about SB 34, and I, I am thankful to the state uh, to our legislature for not overstepping their bounds. Uh, this was a carrot versus a stick. Uh, we have, of course, uh, cities all over Davis County, especially that I focus in, that are not, uh, that there's not an affordable housing unit in their entire city, and they don't want them in their city, and they don't want density in their cities. And, and that's a challenge, because you as a city, yeah, you should have that right to say what comes and what doesn't come and how your city develops. And, but at the same time, you've got to be able to be a team player and understand that there is a desperate need out there for people to be able to find attainable housing. So we started looking this last week at the accessory dwelling units and are in the process of, of revamping our entire general plan. And we'll take that up as, as part of that to make sure that we have a, a code in place, an ordinance in place that 
that produces what we want it to produce with accessory dwelling units. Uh, we, we have tons of basement apartments throughout the city, but we want to make sure that we've got a, now an ordinance in place that not only facilitates them, uh, ADUs, but, but does it in the right way. Uh, our, we've got two opportunity zones, which is fantastic in Clearfield, and so our, our developers are now tapping into that funding source as well to help. And it, it, it's, been, it's been a boon for us. Uh, we're, but again, trying to recreate a city and meet both ends of that spectrum is a, it's an unbelievable challenge, but it's, uh, it's one that we've taken on and we're up to it. So thanks. I'll, I'll stop there and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at some questions. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you've taken on a lot in your city. ADUs, LIHTC, um, hats off to you for, for tackling those, those tough kinds of projects. Um, as you talked about this, um, I want to hit on something that Carson brought up, which is uh, higher density zoning. Um, that is a struggle that every city has because there's a lot of um, ideas around bringing um, apartments into your community and what that brings. Let's talk a little bit about NIMBYism. Let's talk about how you're tackling that issue. I know, Shirlene, you talked about your hack uh, committee, which I think is such a great idea. How are you getting people on board <clears throat> to support uh, higher density zoning? And the mayor and Shirlane, either of you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'll jump in and then I would love to hear more from Mayor Shepard too. Um, we, you know, the city of St. George, uh, kind of took a risk and we built two big apartment complexes in downtown. They both came online last year and they, we knew it was going to be, you know, reshape the way that our downtown functions um, to have this many residents moving into downtown. We are also looking at form-based code and, and looking at some things to make sure that we're planning our downtown area in a really thoughtful and meaningful way. Um, with HACC, and I think this is where it helps, it's helping inform St. George City and how we look at ADUs. We, we do have an ADU ordinance. We have found that having that ordinance is great, but we also have to get the word out to homeowners that they can, that it's an option. And we also have to help figure out ways to help them afford to build the ADU so that they can, you know, we can get those benefits. And so there are some other um, we, we got the ADE ordinance in place and now HACC is helping figure out how do we, how do we make that actually be a, a meaningful tool. Um, the other piece of, of this, and I think Mayor Shepard hit on it beautifully is, you know, each one of our cities, we can't solve this problem on our own. We have to work with our partners and our local municipal, uh, you know, all of our um, neighboring cities. And so that has been one of the really great things about HACK is it's allowed us to come together in a way that it's not just, a, you know, just just the city council members or, or the mayors that are, are tackling this. It's really the people that are building the homes. I mean, Southern Utah Home Builders Association is a primary active member in this and they're looking at how do we not only build multi-million dollar parade of homes but how do we help our developers and our construction industry professionals also build homes that can be you know what what new innovative technologies do we need to be implementing how do we need to be attacking this issue from the policy aspect of it with with what are their challenges and, and working through through that side and the cities and the land costs and all of the construction costs but also how do we just get innovative together and help each other think about it differently? And so we're not, we're really trying hard to not focus building or density in one area. We really feel with, with, within our city and also within our, our county, it needs to be distributed. It needs to be spread out. We don't want to have pockets of only affordable housing with that stigma. We want to have neighborhoods that are thriving and that are inclusive and that, you know, if someone moves into the neighborhood as a young professional, even a, a, a single person, and, you know, we want them to be able to stay in that neighborhood if they want to, as they get married and their family grows and their income grows or whatever, if they choose to do that. And so we're really trying to be thoughtful as a community 
um, about how those different issues that are important to our community play into this and then how from you know my role with economic development at, um, and housing at the city how do we then take that information and how do we help inform ourselves and our policies and um, the decisions that we're making as a city with the tools that we have to move in that direction with a shared vision and so I hope that kind of helps answer some of your questions, Michael. We can go into more you know, specific detail. Um, those are some of the thoughts I had as I was listening to Carson and to Mayor Shepard. And Mayor Shepard, I know you had more you wanted to say. Oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah, you handled that well, Shirley. I, uh, uh, St. George has a, a real big benefit. They stole my previous city manager. So uh, that, that, that helps to know we're helping out St. George now. You are. Thank you. We love him. And we attack things honestly differently. Um, as we developed our form-based code, we brought the public in and they had a huge say as this form-based code developed. And we kept them informed and in as part of the process all along the way. That's still, every time a building starts to go up, all I get is, a, is email after email after email another apartment complex that's what you're building and we've explained throughout the whole process that by bringing that density to our downtown bringing that density along our corridor that brings other development and it will spur other development through it and it has now started to do that and so we're we're seeing businesses start to come into the city and that's a big plus for us but we didn't want that in our case spread throughout the city um, but we want this, this density on our corridors. And so we start from a very, very dense downtown uh, with zero height restrictions on the buildings. In fact, there's a minimum height of four stories in the downtown area. And then we, we kind of tear out from there and level out. And so as you drive into the city, you will see things get denser and denser and denser as, until you reach that core and that is where that that that's the hub. And so we have our first five-story apartment uh, building just about to to break ground as well. And right next to it, a a set of townhomes, because they're right on that fringe of where can they be and how high can they go. It's uh, it's working well, it, and the public's buying in, which is amazing. Uh, they've we've allowed the public to come through and tour some of these apartments and look at them and go, wow. Um, and, and yes, some of them are not, we'll, we'll call attainable. Uh, their apartment prices scare me to death right now. Uh, it, it, in a market level, when you're easily $1,400 a month for an apartment, uh, that's scary. And so as people have come in and, and we've had that fight of, we don't want apartments, we don't want apartments, we don't want apartments, we don't want density. We've had to show them on some of the these that are not funded through outside sources, through LIHTC and, and, and uh, opportunity funds, what those apartments look like. And, and then take them to the others that are being built and say they're just as nice. Your kids could afford to live here. You right now and what you're paying for your house couldn't live in this new set of apartments. So we're trying to mix them together. And when you do that with LIHTC, you're able to take a, a building and do a, in one of our buildings will be a 50-50 split of LIHTC and market rate. Um, what that does is mix two different groups of people together. And in the exact same, there, there's no difference between their apartments. The, the high-end market rate, $1,500 a month apartment that this person is paying is the exact same thing that this person is getting at a significantly different rate. So, it's making that th those things affordable and attainable for them. Yes, and I, th I think there's a common theme with what you and Shirley are both talking about is that it's a, a comprehensive approach to community development and bringing a mix of incomes, a mix of housing types, and making it available for anybody who wants to live there. I want to ask you a question, and, and Carson and, and Meg, I'm going to head this one towards you. Um, one of the big things in zoning that is no one really likes to talk about, it's kind of a dirty word here, is inclusionary zoning. What are your thoughts on inclusionary zoning and should cities 
the state be considering that as a, as a tool for uh, increasing affordable housing? So I'll, I'll uh, start with that one. And uh, again, thank you for uh, letting us join today. And thank you, Mayor and Charlene. You guys are in the trenches and we appreciate what you do um, here and all our, our members. So um, I think as far as inclusionary zoning, zoning goes, some of the things we've heard recently, it's um, there's a range of needs out there, right? Not only um, is a range of needs, but there's a range of answers. And I think the more tools we have in our toolkit, the better, because um, we do have diverse communities, we have diverse regions, we have the Wasatch Front, which has a set of challenges, we have Southern Utah, and then we have the rest of the state, um, which has different housing needs. Um, and so we're, we're trying to see how we can make that whole framework work together. Um, and inclusionary zoning nationwide has had mixed results. I think uh, it, in some cases it produces units, in some cases it doesn't. So again, I think along with some of the other things we've mentioned here, the financing programs, the zoning techniques, um, inclusionary housing is something the state would have to enable us statutorily uh, to do at the municipal level outside of a uh, development agreement. So I think that's something that's certainly up for discussion. I know the Commission on Housing Affordability uh, last year discussed that. I think really right now is what we're excited to see is, um, and with the um, results of SB 34, the first step, because this is a, not a quick fix, right, Mayor? Uh, you know, this takes time, um, and especially as we're building communities, um, we'll, we'll see some reporting coming in to the Department of um, Workforce Services on what the innovation and creativity that cities are doing, and most importantly, the impediments. So what has been the challenge? Financing, neighborhood opposition. Uh, um, so again, I think the more tools, the better uh, that we can have. Thank you, Meg. Do you want, Carson, anything you want to add? Or Mayor Sherlane, anybody, any other thoughts on that? I think, uh, I think Meg summed that up nicely that, yeah, I think more, more tools in the toolbox is always important. Inclusionary zoning might be more effective in uh, a community like Park City or um, a resort communities where you really only have the market forces are so strong that you really only have certain tools that can actually make a difference for attainable and workforce housing. Um, so it's it's again to go back to the every community is different has different housing needs and the more tools available the better. Great, thank you. Um, one, I want to ask one more question before we, we have a couple of questions from our audience um, before we get there. Talk to me a little bit about preservation. Uh, what are cities doing for uh, preservation strategies? Uh, we, are, we are losing affordable housing to market rate developers who purchase it, rehab it, lease it out for higher rates. Any comments or thoughts uh, on ways that we can preserve the housing that we do have that is attainable? That's a tough one. <laughs> and, and we're seeing it nationwide with gentrification. I mean, it's, it's, you've got investors coming in and just buying everything that they can possibly get their hands on. And, uh, and all of a sudden it's not affordable. And on the real estate, I mean, it, it, the, the real estate is what I do for a living on the side. And uh, it, it, it's hard. I don't, I don't know Policies, I mean, it, it, it's easy in certain areas when you've got historic districts and, and such to, to say, yes, we're going to, to, to put zoning in place that would prevent change. Uh, outside of that, it, it's, I don't know that we've found the solution to that yet. I, I'd, I'd love to hear what others have to say because it, it, that's a challenge to, to maintain what you have. Like I said, something that 10 years ago was, a, was 125 to 150 and Clearfield is 300 now. And I don't know how you stop that without building your way out of it. Yeah, I would agree. It's definitely a challenge. I mean, housing prices in St. George are the same, obviously. We're just cranking. And, um, you know, my neighbor across the street just sold their house that they've lived in for a year. And it's not a brand new home. They sold it for $150,000 more than they paid for it 16 months ago. So um, it's, 
that's just not, you know, it, it's not sustainable. Um, we have with with the city of St. George, we have a really strong partnership with Switchpoint, our community resource center, and we donated land to them to build Riverwalk Village, which is going to be having the ribbon cutting actually on the 29th of October. Um, that is a 55 unit uh, low income housing specific focused uh, project it has a deed restriction to maintain that low income status. And that was a part of the project from the very beginning. Um, it's you know built by a nonprofit. And so that was, a, as you can imagine, a, a long, long, long road to put all the pieces together to, to get that off the ground. Um, the, the, um, our Housing Action Coalition is looking into community land trusts and some other tools that we can use to to try to do exactly this you know how do we how do we maintain that attainability as our we know our housing prices are going to continue to go up we're hoping they at least stabilize at some point but if we do create more attainable housing now that doesn't mean it will it will still be attainable in five years and so that has to be a part of the strategies too and the policies that we're employing at the municipal level we want to hopefully have them meet you know help meet those needs instead of um, being barriers to them and so it is really a, a team effort if you will between all of us to figure out how we how we get creative and um, come up with new ideas i will also say that having a state network that's discussing housing and housing challenges is something that i think will continue to help us and sb 34 did help with that um, on the homelessness side we're definitely seeing how the state network and all of our local providers and local communities coming together to share best practices and share ideas and how that works. Those are some of the things that are, are helping us really address homelessness in a different way at the state level and in our communities. And I think the same can be said for housing. Um, if there's nothing that, uh, if, there's, if there's one silver lining with COVID, it is that, you know, communities that are not on the Wasatch Front and do not have quick access to in-person meetings to be a part of these conversations, we now are a part of those conversations because everybody's doing it virtually. And that, I think, is helping our more rural communities who need to address these housing challenges because we have access to those broader conversations and we can, we can learn and we can um, share some of the creative things that we're doing as well and be better as a state. Well, great information. Uh, Charlene, Charlene, you bring up the community land trust and that is a tool I know Park City has used for a long time. Salt Lake City launched one a couple of years ago and that's a great preservation tool. And there are several preservation funds that are underway to help with the multifamily. Let's turn over, um, we've got Haley Archer with a question. So Holly, can we unmute Haley? Sorry I, don't, sorry, I don't know how I hit that, my bad. I don't have a question. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Well, we're glad to have you here. How about Tim? Tim Early. Unmute, okay, I unmute. Thanks, thank you very much. Um, individuals um, seeking uh, affordable or attainable housing, um, or the general public or the general voting public uh, don't have a very large voice in how a city moves forward. Are there well-funded consultants or lobbies that stand in your way of achieving your goals? They haven't come out of the woodwork on our end yet. Uh, in when you say that they don't have, you know, that group doesn't have as big a voice. Um, I actually ensured that they did. Uh, my newest, uh, we, we've got a couple of things inside of Clearfield that uh, at one were a manufacturing community and two were, were the uh, Job Corps second largest facility in their entire network of, of, uh, training centers. Uh, while I was there at a luncheon a few years ago, I sat down to, to lunch and had a, a young man at my table who was now had graduated from Job Corps and uh, was now working at that point for Job Corps. 
he is, uh, he's been living in affordable housing, uh, he and his family, and, and continue to do so. Uh, obviously, with what they were paying him at the Job Corps was not a, in between he and his wife, they're, they're still barely making it. Um, but he's probably one of the best read and sharpest guys that I have ever met. And I told him while we sat down, I said, you ought to, yeah, you ought to run for city council. <laughs> and he, he laughed and said, that's just not, you know, that's not in my cards right now. And we talked a little bit more and he's now my city council member. Uh, he brings a voice. Uh, he is a person of color. He is, uh, sits in poverty and brings a different voice to our city. Uh, in, in a different way that we have to look at things. Uh, it, 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 he's, he's at many times the voice of reason and has ideas that we, we just wouldn't have thought of. And it, it's given us a, a little bit of life and a little bit, uh, a little bit of strength as we try to move this, this, uh, this needle. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Tim. I think that for what we found in, in Washington County is that the more we got out and started talking about this in the community and, and asking, you know, what are the needs? What are the barriers? How do you perceive our housing challenges? Um, we have people constantly reaching out and they're hearing about hack in one way or another, or they, they reach out to the cities and the cities know how to connect them in. So we do, we do encourage that kind of residential citizen involvement in that conversation. We as the policymakers and as you know, the, the, we can pull the network together and we can set those policies, but we cannot do it in a vacuum. And if we're not serving the people that we're trying to serve, if we're not listening to them, how can we really effectively serve them? And so it definitely has to be a team effort and a group effort. And it is a lot about building those relationships and trust. Um, and if, if, you know, a lot of the time, the best thing we can do, I think, is just to, just to listen to what someone has to say and listen to their story. And just as Mayor, um, Mayor Shepard says, invite them into the conversation. And if they're a little bit hesitant, let them know we need them and we need you. And so I do think that we have a lot of responsibility um, as cities beyond the policy side of it to make sure that we're opening the door for those conversations and making sure that we are inviting people to the table, um, not just expecting them to ask to have a seat. And so those are some of the um, important things that maybe don't always get brought out in these conversations. I'm glad you asked the question. And Mayor Shepard, I love the example that you gave. I think it's an inspiring um, thing for all of us to hear, you know, that it can happen in, in, in all levels and it just takes people to, to really want to listen. I agree with those. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. And I'll say he does, he's, he holds our feet to the fire in quality. Good. <laughs> you know? Good. Cause he's not well funded. We're gonna, we say, Hey, we're going to build this place and this is what the developer brings us. And his answer is I'm not signing off on that. If it's at that level. Um, you find a way we're, we're, we're allowing this in the city. We're bringing this, we're encouraging the light tech funding. Look, we want this to be something that, that I would live in or some my, somebody else would live in or the mayor would live in. Good. So, Thank you. Great. So I want to, um, in the few minutes we have left, um, a couple of things, it, it, you know, our, our topic today is policy to action and, and you shared a lot with us on how, um, density affects your communities, the work you're doing there to, take a very comprehensive approach to a community development. Um, so some good policy examples, and then also outreach to your communities and get them involved. I wanna come back to um, Carson's quote at the end of his presentation. I thought it was a really good one, especially with the idea that there are investors out there who are really looking to put money in to uh, apartments. Um, mayor men the mayor mentioned a little while ago how difficult it was to that light tech project. We have seen over the last few years, the amount that investors are willing to pay for those tax credits go down due to CRA re, uh, reform. A um, few years ago, you were seeing $1.36 per credit. Now we're in the low 90s, mid to low 90s. So if there's a, that affects the how to fund, uh, finance a project. Any ideas or anything your cities are doing, uh, Carson and Meg, anything that you guys have seen um, on how cities can help fund 
uh, or provide a gap or whatever it might be to help uh, with the, the capital stack for these projects? You know, that's a, that's a good question and Meg will probably be able to answer better than I, but I think there's some different approaches cities are looking at. We have, I mean, um, large cities with large RDAs or CRAs are often putting some of those resources towards affordable housing, whether it's in preservation or whether it's in um, helping construct new affordable housing. Um, I believe the Salt Lake City RDA just released another $4 million towards affordable housing. Um, that's obviously less feasible in smaller communities without the same resources and sometimes they'll, uh, and there is the 10% the mandatory set aside, but sometimes they'll pool those resources to try to uh, produce more affordable housing within their their region or within a few communities. Um, sometimes they'll work with developers to try to figure out how to reduce costs in other ways so that they can get closer to making them pencil. But it's not a it's not an easy not an easy solution. Like you mentioned, the uh, and and a lot of it's external to even Utah. If you had federal tax the federal tax reductions. Uh, in part reduce the value of the tax credits because a lot of large co companies didn't have the same corporate tax liability. And, and so it really is a, a big process, a big challenge that requires so many different, both local government, state government, county government, and then community stakeholders to come together. Yeah, I, I think, again, it is a huge challenge. And what we've seen is either outside of aggressive municipal uh, infusion of, of general fund or specific if they don't have a housing authority or an RDA, RDA or a CRA. We've seen that in some cases, but that's not feasible for a lot of our um, communities. And I think another strategy or a innovation is engaging employers in the discussion and what is their role and what can they play? And can there be like a mortgage assistance program as part of an employee assistance package? Uh, just a lot of different creativity to, to try to plug all the different holes, but uh, it's, it is very, very complex. I don't think there's a, a magic bullet. It'll be interesting to see what the next year or two brings. We got about two or three minutes left, Mayor or Shirlene. Shirlene, anything you wanna to add to that? Any final comments? Well, we've gone both routes. Um, you know, when you talk, as Meg was saying, either uh, outside investing, uh, we, we've used, our, our increment through our RDAs to, to help these projects come together. Uh, Clearfield Station, our, our transit stop, uh, has roughly a thousand units set to come on board. Um, the, the increment is covering the entire infrastructure for that project. Uh, we're, we're bonding to actually to, uh, to make that happen and get it all done at once so that the development can move forward quickly. Um, and then at the same time, we'd use general fund money uh, with our mobile home park. As I mentioned earlier, we, we overpaid for it. We knew that we were, um, but we needed to make sure that what was built there didn't remain a, a slum, uh, that somebody didn't just simply come in and rehab some trailers and say, this is where you're going to live and I'm going to make a, you know, this will be my huge cash cow, but that it became something that we could be proud of and, uh, and still be, as, I, as I've said, affordable. So we've done both routes. Yeah, great work. Shirlane. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I totally agree. The only other thing I would add is um, kind of leave the, the group with this idea. Our HACS tagline is that we are all in the attainable housing business. So no one in the community is, is exempt from, from being a part of this and being touched by it in some way on some level. And so if we can keep that conversation going and continue to bring all of that creativity together, we will, I, I believe we can come up with really, really unique ways for each community to address it. Um, there are these standard things that and tools that we have, but if, you know, if we have, even on an individual project level, if you understand what the needs are in this way, you can work as partners to make it happen, whether that's financially, whether that's, you know, from a policy and a, and a zoning perspective, whatever it might be. And so um, one of the great things that, that HACC has helped us do in our, in our 
community is break down that barrier between, well, the city doesn't do this and developers don't do this. And we've been able to come together and we don't have those conversations nearly as often anymore. We're all working towards the same goal and we're trying to use the same language. And just that has made a huge difference to then help us identify those other policies or those other actions or those other funding sources or those other tools that we might be able to implement. Great, fantastic. Thank you all. I think we're out of time. Um, hopefully this was helpful to those attending and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you panelists. Thank you guys. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thanks everyone.